Today, uh, we are speaking together because we are talking today uh, in this series, Built Different. If you're new to Catalyst, we teach in series, and we've been talking about different types of relationships, from friendships to dating relationships, did a message on conflict, and today we are talking about marriage. Uh, so we thought it'd be fitting for us to speak together around this topic of marriage this week I was thinking about years ago when I uh, had taken my driver's license examination. Anybody remember your driver's license examination? Hopefully, if you, if you drive, you took one. Um, so, you ever been on the road and you wonder if the guy next to you really took one? You're like, I don't think he, I don't think he passed. And, um, but I remember the hours of study, the classes the exam, and they have you go through all of this, and when you drive, you thank God because they have you go through all this because when you're behind the, the wheel of a vehicle, you, you could do some damage to people if you don't know what you're doing. But what's amazing when it comes to marriage, you can go in the courthouse this week, and they will give you a license and say, good luck, be well fed, right? <laughs> no training, no exam, no book, and, and, and we are seeing the fruit of that in our culture, that over close to half of marriages don't last. An additional 10% of those that do last are not happy. They found recently, Pew Research, this current generation, they call the most marriage resistant generation to date. They've seen the brokenness and they're like, I don't want anything part of that. Understandably, because there's no pain like relational pain. So we wanna to talk today about marriage because God created marriage and that we believe you can actually have a healthy and thriving marriage. Now, we stand before you today not as perfect people. We don't have a perfect marriage at all. We work on it regularly. But you can have a healthy and thriving marriage if you do marriage God's way. If you believe it, can you say amen? So we're gonna dive in today, but before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your word truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we open it up today, we know you're gonna to speak to us and we submit ourselves to your word today. It is in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Three commitments I would encourage you to make to have a healthy and thriving marriage. Here's the first one, if you've taken notes, is to commit to intentionally invest in your marriage intentionally invest in your marriage. Hebrews 13, four says, let marriage be held in honor among all. That word honor means of great value. In other words, this scripture says that your, your, your relationship with your spouse is the most important relationship that you have on earth. It's the most important relationship you have next to God is the one that you have with your spouse. Can I make it practical? So as you're making plans for Thanksgiving, ready for this? That means you prefer what your spouse wants to do for Thanksgiving over what mama wants. Come on, somebody. We love mama, but we prefer what our spouse wants to do for Thanksgiving. Uh, that means when it comes to prioritizing time with certain relationships, before we schedule time with friends, we put time in our schedule with our spouse. That means when it comes to our energy, before we expend all of our energy on our work or on the kids, we, we, we make sure we can serve some energy to invest in our spouse. That it's the most important relationship that we have on earth. So we're gonna protect it. We're gonna invest into it. And be careful. I know we, we talk about this to fight against this propensity. There's a propensity in marriage to end up giving your spouse the leftovers. Like you, you've spent yourself at work and you come home, you have very little to give to your spouse. You spent yourself at work and the kids, and then you can barely like stay awake by that point, come on. Is making sure that we're, we're conserving some energy that we can invest into this relationship. Now let me say this, because some of you listening today, maybe you're single, maybe you're single and long to be married, maybe you're single and long to be married again, here's my encouragement for you in today's message, uh, is to lean in and take notes as you think about that future relationship. Um, maybe you're here today and you're single and you have no desire to be married. Uh, I do believe this. God's word can speak to you regardless of what season you're in. Amen? But, but make sure you honor it. Genesis 2 says this in verse 24, that this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. That word united in the Hebrew means this, to pursue hard with affection and devotion. It means to be intentional. 
to not just kind of put things on autopilot, but to be intentional and to pursue each other. It means that, listen, the pursuit doesn't stop after we're dating. (laughs) It means that we keep pursuing our spouse with intentionality. With, with, we keep pursuing our spouse with affection. You know, last year, I had, uh, we had planted seeds in our front lawn to have some grass. And during that season of trying to, trying to grow some grass in our yard, I began to take notice of my neighbors who had lush green lawns. And what I noticed was, as I was watching what they did to make sure their lawns were lush and green, I noticed my one neighbor who like has a beautiful lawn. He was out there every day. He was watering the lawn. He had lawn maintenance companies come on a regular basis. And here's what I noticed. His soil was not any more special than my soil. He worked his soil. The reason his grass was lush and green and beautiful, because that man worked it. Can I encourage you today? Listen, here's a lie that we can all believe. We can look at somebody else's marriage and they're, they're healthy and we think, well, they must just be more compatible than my, my spouse and I. Here's the truth, that if you see a healthy and thriving marriage, you're looking at a couple that has worked hard on their marriage. Because the natural drift is not a healthy and thriving marriage. So you have to be intentional. We're going to invest. We're going to do the right things. So we're going to pursue our spouse. That means that we're going to pursue having deep conversation and connecting at an emotional level. That means we're going to do the things that we did before. Come on. If you took her on romantic dates before you got married, you should take her on more romantic dates when you get married. Let's go. That, that you, should, you should pursue your spouse with a lot more intentionality. Is your spouse a priority to you? And oftentimes we can look at our calendars and we don't even intentionally like schedule each other in. Um, and before we know it, we're exhausted. And at the end of the day, we have given nothing uh, to them. In fact, we, this happens to all of us. In fact, our, our priorities, our relationships kind of get out of order because life is busy. It happens to all of us. And also there are competing demands and competing distractions at all times, including the phones that we carry in our pockets. There's nothing worse than trying to have a conversation with your spouse and you're like, so I'm here. Hi. Um, This has happened to all of us. We've experienced it, but we've got constant distraction. Um, Prioritizing our spouse might look like saying no to another kid's activity for the parents in the room so that you have a little bit of margin and your emotional capacity (laughs) to be able to connect with your spouse. It might also look like saying no to a girl's night out or a guy's night out, even though you've planned it, but you know there's distance between the two of you, and that is time you're going to intentionally take away from what you should be investing in. Those things are important. We need to have friendships outside of marriage. We need to have that, but not at the expense of the other person. Um, For all of those working full-time jobs and home responsibilities, It is very easy to give everything you have to work and leave nothing left for each other. And then you end up just taking each other for granted and what you do for one another to keep your life moving. In fact, Romans 12.10 says, honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In other words, when we choose to honor one another, what we're doing is we're actually serving God. We are serving God in the ministry of marriage, which is a calling. It's a calling. So if you're married, let me help you out today. You have said yes to the calling of marriage as unto God. We are honoring God when we honor one another. You know, we have to acknowledge our Western culture. There are two things that we, you probably have seen it, that people can put before their marriage. Number one is their work. Uh, You probably have seen it where people almost, you know, proverbially lay their marriage on the altar of work success. Or it's kids. Like, kids get everything. And, and, and you have very little. So you have to be intentional about this. Uh, I love Pastor Craig Rochelle wrote a book. He and his wife uh, called From This Day Forward. And he, he says this, because I love to just make it practical. He says, if you think of something nice to say to your spouse, say it. That's a simple way to make an investment. Hey, fellas, when your wife walked out of the house today and you thought, she is looking good, don't just think it, say it, come on. If you think to yourself, when you come home, maybe your spouse cleans the kitchen 
and you think to yourself, wow, this kitchen looks incredibly much better, is to say it. If you see the way they handle maybe a misbehaving child and you think, wow, they handle that so well, say something. Like if you see, if you think of something nice to say, say it. And then on the flip side, if you think of something nice to do, do it. Like tomorrow morning, man, I'm gonna make their coffee before they get up, do that. Or if you think, I'm gonna cook them their favorite meal, do that. Or if you cannot cook, do not cook them their favorite meal. <laughs> That's not romantic. Order them their favorite. <laughs> know your strengths, right? But, but be intentional. Like, but, but don't overthink it. If I think of something nice to do, I'm going to do it. I think of something nice to say, I'm going to say it. Now, let me all say this. When it comes to your financial investments, if you have a, a 401k or an IRA or 403b, you probably make systematic investments into that. Meaning you don't just like decide every month, how much am I going to invest this month? Now you might add to it, but you probably have a base amount. Like every paycheck, I'm putting this much into my retirement account, right? You have a systematic investment. Why? Because over the course of time, those investments compound. And you at the end of your, you know, retirement, you have a return on your investment. Listen, the same with your marriage. Do not leave your marriage to like flippant or spontaneous investments. Like have a systematic and strategic investment you're making into your marriage. Now there are a number that I could give you. I think like for example, one is having an annual vacation. And if you have kids, you know this, an annual vacation is without the kids. Because when you vacation with the children, I call that a work trip that you don't get paid for. You pay for it, right? It's like I'm on a work trip and I'm paying for it. No, but a vacation which is you and your spouse connecting, right? But here's the one, if you're going to add any, I think the most impactful is a weekly date. If I could sit down with each couple, I would implore you, have at least one hour a week. You have 162 uh, a week, I believe. Have one hour a week where you're like, this is just for our marriage. This is just for us to invest in each other. We're not going to talk about our finances. We're not talking about the kids. We're not talking about our schedules. We are connecting one with another. And they might be thinking, pastor, that's no way that can happen. Like we don't have a babysitter in this area. Or you, you, our work schedules are, you know, different. Or th there are different reasons I understand but here's how I would challenge you, is find an hour a week. It's, it's looked different in different seasons for us. In some seasons, it was an evening date night. In some seasons, it was like put the kids to bed early and then you have a date night at home. Come on. In the summertime, buy blackout shades. Come on, right? So you're like, kids, it's nighttime. No, it's not, Dad. I see sunlight. No, it is, not, it is nighttime. Nighttime. <sighs> right? But, but you, you got to fight for it. I heard a couple a few weeks ago, they take a lunch hour once a week when they both are working from home. They take that lunch hour together. Like fight for it. Don't give into the cultural norm of not dating. And listen, okay, so what do you do on the date? Do you just kind of have a meal together or you just go for it? I mean, you can, it can be whatever. You can go for a walk together. Here's two questions. I got this as well from Pastor Craig Rochelle's book that I would encourage you to ask while on your date. Number one is ask, your spouse, what am I currently doing as your spouse that's serving you well? Here's why. You'll find out what you're doing that's helping them to feel loved. And here's what I found. There's sometimes she'll say things that I didn't know that meant a lot to her. Or, and, and then it also gives you a chance, if you're the spouse, like receiving the question, to affirm your spouse Hey, when you put the kids to bed, I feel so loved. Or hey, when I come home from work after a long day and you have dinner made, I feel so loved. Or again, it, it gives a chance. And then the second question is this, is what could I do differently to serve you better? Now, be prepared to hear whatever they have to say and do what they have to say. Now listen to me. If you ask that question 52 times in a year, and you do 52 things to show your spouse to serve them better, I guarantee you your marriage will be healthier because of it. Again, don't overthink it. You just systematically, the same way you make financial investments, make investments in your marriage and ask these questions. And listen, it compounds over time. And when you're married, one year, two years, five years, 10 years, now you have all of these weeks of times where you learned how I can love and serve my spouse better. 
The second thing, point number two, if we're going to live, we're going to have healthy, thriving marriages, we're going to have to humbly consider our spouse. In fact, Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the other. You know, Paul's writing this letter from a prison cell. So if anyone has the right to sit in self-pity, I would say Paul could, but he doesn't. He chooses to write a letter saying, hey, value each other above yourselves. He's saying, hey, don't look only to your own interest, but look to the interest of others. I think what Paul's trying to communicate to us is saying, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking about yourself less. So the worst thing we can do in any relationship is to not come in secure and think less of ourselves. We need to have what I like to call Godfidence. This is who God's called me to be. This is who I am. We're bringing two healthy people with healthy, healthy identities to the table. But also, let me also look to the interest of others. Let me not just think about myself all the time. And left to ourselves, that's, we're just human. That's what flesh does. We think about ourselves first. He's just saying, hey, hey, do a little less of that and a little bit more of thinking about other people. In fact, as a parent, we are all, parents, we are always teaching our kids constantly about looking not only to your own interests, which comes totally natural, but also to the interest of your siblings. So every morning we hear kind of like, dun, 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 all the way down the stairs. You can hear all six feet coming as fast as you can. It's like a race. And they are trying to race to the cereal box, which sometimes is Rice Krispie tre- treats because they snap, pop, and, you know, they crack. You know what I'm talking about. They do the, the, the thing. They talk. And so... As a part of that, they're always so concerned, I got to get the last, I don't want to, you know, somebody's going to get the last bowl. And we're constantly reminding them like, hey, we have lots of variety of breakfast items and we have more than enough cereal, but this always ends up in fights. And so they're kind of fighting over it and we're taking these opportunities to be like, hey, it is, it's okay, you can give them the last cereal. There's bagels, right? There's all kind of other things that we could eat. And so this one particular morning, I came down and I heard my son um, who had, had said, hey, it's okay to our youngest. He's like, you can have the last cup of cereal. Can I just tell you as a mom, my heart melted. I was like, yes, we're getting it. They are hearing me, right? Um, and then wh- what was interesting is that my son also, he went to his next best alternative for breakfast and found out there was only one teaspoon of the amazing maple syrup left. And he gave it to his older sister. And in this moment, I thought to myself, man, I wonder if my son caught the joy of giving and he caught the joy of what it means to put others, not only thinking about myself, but I'm going to think about other people. And it was contagious to him. He's like, oh, that felt great. Let me do it again. And as we take that approach in our marriage, oftentimes we can, if we're honest with ourselves, be like children. We're like, I got, I got to get mine. I got to make sure I get what I need. But the reality is, yes, we should consider our own interest and speak up for what you need. But also, if we'll take a posture of thinking about the other people, then you typically can't outgive each other when you have this posture. You know, Jesus willingly and intentionally laid down his life. He was the greatest example. He laid his life down for us. And because of that, he gives us the power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us to walk out this thing called marriage and continually uh, put each other above ourselves. You know, in some cases, um, in a parenting season, we can often fall into the trap of being hyper-focused on what our kids need. Or what, if you're a caretaker, you're thinking about the person that you're caring for in your life, maybe in a different stage of life, you're caring for someone else. And if we're not careful, we get completely sucked in and we completely forgot about our spouse in that season. And it, you know, it was, it was recent that where Jeremy was like, Hey, you know, you spend a lot of time with the kids, (laughs) you know, like, Oh, I didn't even realize that I had been inconsiderate of your, your needs as a spouse. And all of us can fall into this. Um, for others of you, it's work demands. 
the, the work is so intense. I've talked to many of you and it is taking so much from you that you have no emotional bandwidth for your spouse. And in some seasons, what it looks like to consider one another is saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to divest a little bit here so I have leftovers for my spouse. And by the way, they shouldn't be leftovers. They should be planned. You are intentional and planned about giving that to each other. You know, self-centeredness is a silent killer. It's a silent killer in marriage. And we often don't think about how that purchase that we made and we didn't discuss how it actually causes pain and inflicts pain on the other person because we just kind of did our own thing and we didn't think about the other person. Um, You know, we often don't think about how planning a night out, which is not a bad thing. We're pro, like, you should have friends. (laughs) Please have friends outside of your marriage. But... We don't often think about, man, well, if I go do this and, and, you know, I had a work trip last week, guess who the other person is picking up all of the home responsibilities and slack, which can often feel, it can feel painful. It can feel inconsiderate. It's great. I, I think it's important too to cultivate honesty in your relationship so that the other person can communicate when they feel like they're not considered. Like I remember before I had taken a work trip and I had said yes to a work trip before even considering the effect on her. And it was after the fact she communicated by, because here's the reality, and this is very important. Your yes, if you're married, is not just your yes, it's your spouse's yes. And sometimes we say yes for them without even talking to them. So it's important that you know, she helped me realize, hey, when you went on that work trip and you didn't consider X, Y, Z that was happening back at home and how it affected me. And again, that wasn't my intention, I was just being inconsiderate. I wasn't being considerate of what she needed and how to best. And again, to go back to, this is so important. When it comes to work or kids, the most important relationship, I should be saying no to work more for her sake than I should be saying no to her for work's sake. Because biblically speaking, this is the most important relationship. Also, I should be saying no to my kids more for her sake than saying no to her for my kids' sake because this is the most important relationship. And if you are a parent in this room, I'll take this from my work when I was a psychologist working with teenagers and adolescents and children. I know this for a fact in research. The most important thing you can do for your kids is have a healthy marriage. They have found in research, it produces a deep sense of emotional security in your kids. And the adverse on the other side is also true. There's a deep insecurity when there's not health in mom and dad. Doesn't matter how much you do. Seeing mom and dad healthy in that relationship will produce a deep sense of security and flourishing in your kids. Yeah, we also have to choose to love our spouses. First Corinthians 13, four through seven says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love loses, uh, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. You know, love is a fruit of the spirit. In fact, Galatians 5 lays out what are the fruits of the spirit. And those are produced when we are becoming more Christ-like. We're spending more time in God's word. What does it look like to live in loving relationship with God? Well, when we're doing that, then, then fruit is produced in our lives. It's really hard to manufacture on your own. In fact, I would even deem to say it's pretty impossible to sustain. It's only with the power of the Holy Spirit who's helping uh, to produce the kind of fruit that lasts. In fact, we often, we have a uh, fruit bowl in our house, and oftentimes you've got fresh fruit, and as you know, it doesn't stay very long, right? It's not like the stuff, the package stuff you buy at Costco. This stuff is going bad quickly if you don't use it. And oftentimes what I'll notice, like I'll be going about life and forget that, you know, you had apples and oranges sitting there and nobody ate them. And so all of a sudden you start to see fruit flies, and you're like, oh, these nasty little things. They irritate me so bad and they're really hard to get rid of because they multiply so quickly. I I, I have a problem with fruit flies. And in addition to that, you start to smell decomposing fruit. It's like giving off gases. You're like, ooh, what is that? And oftentimes we don't realize that we are lacking our own fresh fruit of the spirit in our own lives, but our spouse might be smelling it. They're like, that stinks, (laughs) right? 
And it's not until it's brought to your awareness that you're like, ooh, it's time for some fresh fruit. And in our relationship, it's important that we're both getting that fresh fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can sustain what it looks like to walk out real love. In fact, John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. It's impossible to love well, your spouse, if you are not in relationship with the one who is love. And so this chapter of 13, chapter 13 is all about what it means to really walk out real love, lasting love. And it is impossible without the help of God in our relationships. That's great. You know, you see 1 Corinthians 13 is known as a chapter of love. That's why it's often read at a, at a wedding. But nowhere in chapter 13 do you see love referred to as a feeling. And what do we often say in our culture? Well, I fell in love or I fell out of love. Now, those feelings are real. It's just not love, biblically speaking. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice that you make. Now, I'm not saying the feelings are unimportant, but making that choice to love. You know, recently, I've, I've noticed I'm changing. In my 20s and my 30s, um, I've been lifting weights since I was 18. And I have never not been motivated to lift weights. Like even like when I was in my 20s and 30s, if it was like 10 p.m. at night, I haven't lifted weights that day, I would go to the gym. Like I'd be like, this is important. But then I hit 40s. <laughs> and it is a lot less attractive. <laughs> Anybody else feel that? We'll just so get all of a sudden we'll I'm like, I don't, I don't like the gym anymore. <laughs> So here's what I've learned, but I don't let my feelings lead me or that because I have a, I have a vision to be physically healthy. So those afternoons that I don't feel like it, I just like drink some caffeine, hype myself up. I go to the gym, even I don't feel like it. And listen, in marriage, there will be some days, some mornings, and sometimes that has nothing to do with your spouse, anybody else, you're ever in a mood, you're just like, you just don't feel like loving people. Come on, anybody else? It's Okay. <laughs> I have those days. I'm just like, I don't feel like it. But here's the good news. God doesn't call you to be led by your feelings. We're led by our choices. So I'm going to choose to love. I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to be kind in those moments. If we're going to love our spouses well, it's going to require us to really practice 1 Corinthians 13. So I want to highlight three. So we're going to have to practice patience. Patience is actually defined as overlooking offenses. So that means that we are going to have to be patient with our spouse's shortcomings and their blind spots. And here's the reality. We absolutely should because of the grace of God in our own lives. The truth is none of us are perfect. We all have blind spots, um, but it is so much easier to point the finger at the other person. But the reality is we have to be patient, not only with ourselves, but with each other's blind spots. Patience is going to require us to pray. Love praise. And here's the reality. Sometimes I have found in my own life, it is really hard when you want to hang on to anger about that thing because you don't feel justified. When you pray for your spouse, it is really hard to stay angry at them. And it keeps our heart supple so that God can speak to us because no issue is ever one way, right? There's always things that we are contributing to it as well. Um, and then for others, some of you, there's some qualities that really annoy you about your spouse, or maybe it's just us. <laughs> I don't have any qualities <laughs> like that. I have found that those are actually the very opportunities God is giving us to grow in love. We're praying, God, change the other person. He's saying, hey, what if we just look right here? Yep. What's going on in us? It doesn't mean that, that, yes, they probably need to change too, but that's not your responsibility. Yeah. Our responsibility is dealing with us. That's great. We have to act with kindness. The word kind means to show oneself useful. Are you helpful to your spouse as you consider their needs? It's just kind to not step over the laundry and kick it. <laughs> just put it in the washing machine. It's those small acts of kindness that allow us to 
exemplify the love of Jesus to our spouse in those things. It's just meaning sometimes if we're left to our own, all we're, we're going to just think about us and what we need to do and where we need to go and not think about the ripple effect of how it impacts each other. In fact, if your spouse is making dinner, kindness looks like doing the dishes. If your spouse is bathing the children and putting and, and you know, maybe kindness looks like, Hey, I'll put them to bed. Maybe kindness looks like, man, I, I've, I'm kind of, I mean, I'm having a cr- crush in this work week and I got everything done and I got some extra energy. What if I just kindly took a step further and actually picked up some of theirs just because I love them? That's what kindness looks like. It also looks like keeping, uh, the third thing is just to keep a short account. So love doesn't keep record of wrong. And if, if I have any honest spouses in the room, they're probably at least one scorekeeper in the family (laughs) and in that relationship. And it tends to be the person who they're, you know, they're constantly looking at the unbalanced scorecard. Typically, that's the person that typically tends to hold the scorecard. Like, you know, for two years, you (laughs) missed taking out the trash 10 times. Let me give you the dates of when you missed it. Right. Or, Hey, it was your turn to actually go get the oil changed. Um, and for six months, I have been the one to do it. Right. It's those kind of comments that are not helpful. In fact, especially if you've solved an issue, it is unfair to resurrect that issue again. It's under the blood of Jesus. We have got to move on. We also have to have a never give up spirit in marriage. Love says, don't give up. Don't give up. In fact, some of you have drifted apart because maybe the romance is gone. Well, maybe it's just time to return to the things that we did when we fell in love. How did we start? I think we're due for a long walk on the beach soon, right? There's just some of those things that we just haven't, we stopped doing the things that we once did. And and oftentimes it's just life circumstances change and the pressures of life become so weighty that we forget to do those things. And before you know it, you've become business partners and you're tolerating each other. And those are the moments, it happens to all of us. Those are the moments to say, ah, wait a minute, I need to start practicing love actively and choosing love differently. In fact, some of you are, maybe you've experienced pain and betrayal in your relationship. Maybe some of you have some trauma that related to the relationship. That is the time to go get help. Don't suffer silently. These matters are going to need a third party. You've got to go get counseling. Maybe you start with a biblical guidance that we push you towards counseling for the long haul. For others of you, you just need accountability and you're lonely in your marriage. Jump into a marriage group. Get into a marriage group. Do a book discussion. Get a marriage coach. They're everywhere. Get the right ones, by the way. The ones that are going to point you towards Jesus. They're not like, you go, girl. You do deserve that. You don't need that. You don't need that in your life. You don't need it. It's <laughs> a great caveat. Here's, here's the last point, And at the risk of sounding cliche, it, it is the most important. And that is to keep God at the center of your marriage. Um, you know, there are lots of things in our life that can be the center of our marriage. Our marriage can revolve around our work schedules. That what determines when we spend time together and how we spend time together is what's the work week look like. It can be our kids, right? Their kids' schedules and what the kids are taking from you can determine it. Um, It can be a lot of things. It can can be building wealth and possessions. Now, all three of those things are great things. There's nothing wrong with them. They are just terrible foundations on which to build your marriage. And you need a foundation that will last through the years. And the only foundation the Bible says is a firm foundation for your life is building it upon Jesus Christ. It's building upon your relationship with God. Jesus in Matthew 22, he he said it this way. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. In your marriage, there are many things you will do together as a married couple. You will, you will raise kids together. You will build a life together. You, you will do many things in your life together. But the most important thing is seeking God together. The most important thing. And Jesus says, this is the first and greatest, that you make sure that you are seeking God first. Let me give you some practicals on how, how you can keep God at the center of your marriage. And there's kind of some levels I'll speak to of this because some of you are living parts of this out beautifully. Number one is to worship together. I commend you today. You're worshiping in the house of God. There's power in worshiping together. Take it a step further. Don't just attend church and worship together, but at lunch or later that evening, 
while you're having a meal is ask yourself, ask each other, hey, what did God speak to you about in that message today? And today's message is a great message to have a conversation around. Hey, maybe you're, you're like, pastor, we're already doing that. Here's, here's the application for you. is to get into a community group together. I know we have, we have several groups that are for couples. And then we have other groups that are just great groups to join. We, we were actually speaking this week about in our marriage, the, the seasons where we grew the most, we were in a group together. And then the last part, maybe you're already doing that. I would say is serve together. I have seen, even today, couples in our kids' ministry, first impressions, our, our worship and production teams, couples that serve together, there's a joy that that brings, serving together and being together, is putting God first by worshiping and being planted in the house of God. Number two is read the Bible together. Now, some couples might do a reading plan through the Bible app on your phones. That's a great way to kind of study scripture together. I know for her, her and I, we would do a lot of book studies. We read a Christian book on marriage together and talk about it. Um, for us, a mainstay is we talk about what God is speaking to us in his word. So we'll ask each other, hey, what's God showing you? What's God doing in your life speaking to you? Here's what I would encourage you with in your marriage is let the decisions you make be filtered through the word of God first. And we wonder how are we raising our kids let the word of God be the first thing you go to. How are we going to manage our money? The word of God is the first thing you go to. That we let, we let the word of God shape our family values, which we all have values, by the way. Some are known and some are subconscious. Uh, but be intentional about what are our values? What are the filters we're going to make when we're making decisions about our life and, and are raising our kids and building a life together? And then lastly is to pray together. As she said, it's hard to stay mad at somebody you're praying for. There's power in praying together. And here's what I would say specifically, when you are making big decisions, like for us, you know, remember when it was like when to have children or if you're making a, a job change, remember every yes you make is a yes we make. When you get married, you no longer have, well, these are my decisions. No, it's, it's us now because <laughs> the two become one. So you're prayerful because here's why, when it comes to when to have kids, uh, where to move, what job to take, we always have this posture. We don't wanna just know what does Jeremy want, what does Christina want? We wanna know what does God want for us? Because what God wants for us, do you know God wants your marriage to be more blessed than even you do? He does. I'm gonna tell you why in a second. Because the power of marriage. So seeking God and saying, God, speak to us, show us how you want us to live this out. You know, marriage isn't easy because we have a spiritual enemy. And John 10, 10 reminds us that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus is saying, hey, you have an enemy and I've come to, to give you life to the full, but you need to be aware that he is working actively against your marriage. And the reason for that is because Christ in the church, this is marriage is a representation of that. It's Christ's love for the church. That's why he calls us a bride and he's the groom. Because if the enemy can, can get there, he can break down families and generations that need to, to know that they have a creator that loves them and desires to, to live in loving union with him. And, and this is how the enemy works. And, um, and so sometimes I think we, we can get, um, we think it's just us, right? It's just our flesh. It's just him. It's just her. But the reality is that you have an enemy who's actively working against you to make you think that each other are the enemy. When the reality is often we just have to get on the same page that, hey, we have a common enemy and it's not each other. Yep. And, um, you know, one of the things that I have to ask myself to oftentimes is how do, you, how do you know if fighting, if you're fighting the enemy, like a spiritual attack on, on your marriage? And one of the things is, do you find yourself actively thinking about, which is out of character for yourself, man, what would life be like if we, if we hadn't gotten married? Did I make a mistake? What would that look like if, if, if I just returned a single life? And that looks better than your current situation. Another way that the enemy kind of plants those seeds 
of doubt is when you find yourself just fighting over petty stuff, you know, you squeeze the toothpaste the wrong way <laughs> and you've done it for like 10 years, right? It's those petty things that you just start getting really just irritating you, right? And before you know it, you're edgy with each other, right? Those are great moments to just take a step back and say, you know what, is there an enemy at work here? Because I'm, I want to be, we're on the hashtag same team, same team. It's great. That's great. You know, there's the Ecclesiastes. It says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And relationally, it's referring to the two of us in marriage and God. And here's the reality um, that, that as we kind of close today is that marriage, marriage takes work. Um, it's, it's for everybody, but it's worth it. It's worth the work. And you're gonna have conflicts in marriage. And if you're not married yet, you will have conflict in your future marriage. <laughs> you will. But here's the reality, is that with God at the center, your marriage can be healthy and thriving. You're gonna have differences. You're gonna face difficulties. And some seasons will be harder than others. But with God at the center, you can have a healthy and thriving marriage. And God, as we see the scriptures, he is so intentional around marriage and here's why. Because your marriage has a much bigger purpose than you. Ephesians 5, Paul says this, that marriage is actually a picture of Christ in the church. That as Christina mentioned, we are the bride of Christ and he's referred to as our groom. So watch this, this is the Bible speaks the most powerful message of the gospel that we will ever preach is our marriage, period. So if I am the enemy of your soul, John 10, 10, what is the one thing I would love to mess up so people's perspective of God's love will be messed up? It's marriage. Can I tell you, this is why it's so important, church, that we work hard to have healthy and thriving marriages because it's not just about your happiness. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when they see your marriage, they see a glimpse of the love that God has for them. And it causes people to believe in the gospel once again. This is why marriage is so important. It's not just so we would have a great life together. Yes, God wants that. But it's at this relationship, people would see it and they would see a glimmer of the love that Jesus Christ has for humanity. So I wanna encourage you as the scriptures say, honor marriage above all. Because it is the relationship of greatest value in your life. If you receive God's word, can you say amen, church?